Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. This series is designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. To keep up with all things digital, please subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Jennifer Ziegel, a partner at Kleinbird LLC, Ross Bruck, a principal of Estate Genie, and Justin Brown, a partner at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders LLP, with today's topic. Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. For today's episode, we'll be talking about the cryptocurrency exchange Quadriga CX and the estate of Gerald Cotton. First, we're joined with accomplished filmmaker Shona McDonald, who has just released a new documentary called Dead Man Switch, A Crypto Mystery, which is now playing on Discovery+. Plus. Dead Man Switch chronicles the investigation post-collapse of Quadriga CX, the subsequent bankruptcy proceedings, and the mysterious death of the exchange CEO, Gerald Cotton. Next, we're joined by Digital Planning Podcast veteran Sharon Hartung and our own Jen Ziegel, whose book, Digital Asset Entanglement, Unraveling the Intersection of Estate Laws and Technology, is set to come out in March of 2022. The book highlights the importance of digital asset planning awareness and the challenges associated with managing digital assets through a comprehensive case study of Quadriga CX and the estate of Gerald Cotton. We are so happy to be the first stop on your book tour and for Ross and me to flip the tables on Jen. So to get started, Shona, we want to congratulate you for your tremendous success with the documentary. But I'm wondering, how did you come up with the name of your title and what is a Dead Man Switch? Hi, thank you for having me. Well, Dead Man Switch, we heard as we went along. So a Dead Man Switch, I'll try and explain it succinctly, is if you have something important or you do something every day and you have an audience or you're trying to keep money safe or whatever it is, that if you don't do something, if you don't log into your account within a certain time period that you set, be it seven days or a week or 24 hours, that that system shuts down essentially and the information that's critical, the passwords, et cetera, gets sent out to whoever you've assigned that information to so that they can pick up and carry on. So in this case, Gerald Cotton managed a lot of people's money and a lot of people's cryptocurrency. And one would have thought he would have a dead man switch if something happened to him so that all of the, the money could go and be managed by somebody else. But apparently, if he did, it didn't work uh, or he just didn't. So that's great. Can we can we dive in a little bit more for our listeners who are not familiar with the Quadriga story? Can can you give a brief background? I know there's a lot to to take in and there's a lot of complexity to the story, but can you give the the thirty thousand foot overview? Sure. Uh, so Quadriga CX CX standing for Canadian Exchange was a Canadian cryptocurrency company, and at the time it was in 2013 when they started it. It was the biggest cryptocurrency company in Canada and not big in the world. It wasn't top 100 in the world, but in Canada it was big. And it was one of the only cryptocurrency exchanges that people could use if they were buying or selling Bitcoin. And in 2018, the owner of that company, that exchange, Gerald Cotton, founder, co-founder, went to India on his honeymoon and to open an orphanage. And he died. He was 30 and he died of a Crohn's related heart attack. And with him died all of the passwords, uh, all of the money. So 215,000 Canadian dollars of crypto gone. 115,000 users lost money. Some their life savings, some five grand, some $200, but lots of money gone with him. And there are questions about whether he's dead or not. Yeah, I was just going to... So <laughs> often when I've heard the story explained, the word purportedly died is associated with that. So so can we can you explain a little bit about some of the conspiracy theory or shall we say just questions around the status of his death? Sure. We used allegedly, I think in the film. <laughs> but um yeah, I mean, you know, I mean it does sound like if you were to write the story and you were to write someone at 30 years old going to India on their honeymoon to open an orphanage and dying. I mean, that's a pretty good story, right? And if you're gonna disappear, India seems like a place you could 
do so. So that's it certainly got people um, interested. Now, I will say he was not cremated in India. His body was sent back to Canada, allegedly. Um, but even Nathan Vanderclip is a Globe and Mail reporter, and he went and sort of tracked Jerry's last few days. And um, there are even little things like the embalmer that they first took him to wouldn't embalm him. And his body was taken back to the hotel and the hotel tried to take him to the hospital. Like there's all sorts of funny little twists and turns in it that make it ripe for controversy. Shona, for those of our listeners who don't have a good understanding of the case, can you kind of go into a little bit more detail and really explain why this is such a significant case to be looking at? I can do my best. So the company was started in 2013 by Gerald Cotton co and his co-founder, a man named Michael Patron, who had changed his name. His original name was Omar Danani. And they opened the company. They set it up. There were no other exchanges in Canada. If you wanted to buy or sell Bitcoin, you were going to go through Quadriga CX. And they had banking troubles along the way, which wasn't uncommon for, for cryptocurrency exchanges. In 2016, Michael Patron uh, allegedly left the company, leaving Jerry in charge. And from a business perspective, what was later learned is that there were no company accounts. Gerald was taking money in from hundreds of thousands of people. It was running through his personal laptop. It was running through his personal accounts and with no oversight. But that was the only place to go. So people were funneling money in. At the same time, what's important is that the cryptocurrency market started to explode in 2017. So Bitcoin was worth a couple thousand dollars a coin, went up to $25,000 a coin, 20,000 US a coin. So Gerald was getting millions and millions and millions of dollars coming in through his personal bank accounts, which he was managing. There were maybe seven employees for the company. So there were stories of money being dropped off in shoeboxes on people's doorsteps. Um, you know, you wanted to cash out, you couldn't cash out. There were banking problems. You can look at their Facebook accounts and people are writing in saying, I can't get my money out. And so there just started to be this series of issues that he was dealing with or in hindsight, not dealing with. So then companies in trouble. Some say that he was always worried about being kidnapped so he would keep his laptop with him. And then 2018, he goes to India on his honeymoon uh, with his wife, Jennifer, and allegedly dies. And all of that money, all of those accounts, everything funneling through his personal bank dies with him, essentially. So if you had $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, it's gone. If you had left your your cryptocurrency on the exchange or you'd left your cash on the exchange, it's gone. And so... They didn't announce that he had died until a month after he did. So in that month, between when he died at the end of 2018 and early 2019, when they announced, people were still sending in money. If you had sent $10,000 into the company, gone. So it was just this massive new industry that people were putting into, highly risky, and he allegedly took advantage of, of things. And we're going to get into, in the second half of this episode, a little bit more around planning and precautions when we talk to Jen and Sharon about planning with crypto. But I think some of the listeners might hear this and react with a question of, but I thought the blockchain and I thought things associated with the blockchain were supposed to be more decentralized and therefore protected. And how can assets be gone if it's on the blockchain? And you must hear that question or some variation of it quite often. Yeah, it's definitely come up. And, you know, I mean, in the film itself, we interviewed a woman based out of L.A. who has a company called My Crypto, Taylor Monahan, And she thought, well, I'm going to dig into this and I'm going to figure out where the money went. It's on the blockchain so I can find it. And she spent days and days and days and days tracking it. So it is traceable, but there's all sorts of I mean, you can so you take your money you put your $100 onto an exchange, you buy a Bitcoin, you transfer that Bitcoin into some other cryptocurrency. There's thousands of them at this point. And then you move that to another exchange and then you run it through a mixer and then you cash it out to US dollars and then you buy some other crypto with it. like so the there are ways of tracing it, but it can also get pretty mixed up. He held on to, I assume, the private keys right, of the various 
cryptocurrencies. And I think you had said in one of your interviews that if you don't hold the private key, you don't hold the money or you don't hold the asset. Can you kind of explain what your thinking is there and, and what you've learned from this case study and, and why you feel that way? So it's not my expertise. I made a film about it, but I'll do my I will do my best. So not your keys, not your crypto is what they say. So you buy crypto, you buy a Bitcoin and you're not buying a tangible coin, a physical object. You're buying a string of numbers, essentially. And if you don't have that string of numbers, if you don't have it written down, then you don't own anything. So you can you can buy the Bitcoin. If I go buy a Bitcoin right now and spend my 50,000 US dollars or whatever it is today, and I get my string of numbers, I can take that off an exchange and put it on a private wallet at home, basically like putting it in my wallet with my paper money. And as long as I keep those keys and don't lose them and don't drop it on the street or whatever, as long as I have that string of numbers, I have my Bitcoin. However, if I buy it and I think, well, I don't want the risk, I'm going to leave it on the exchange. The exchange goes under and I don't have that key, then it's it's gone. So you hear all the time now people who've said, oh, I bought 10 of them when it first came out and it was three dollars. I don't know where the piece of paper went. Surely I can get it back. And you can't it's gone. So, you know, there's hot wallets, which are the ones on the exchange. There's cold wallets, which is taking it off the exchange. So there are ways to protect your investment. But even having spent a few years tangentially in this space, it still all feels a little bit nebulous and sketchy to me. Now there's people dealing with it and doing it and working in it. But to me as sort of, um, an amateur, you know, user and someone who's skated around the outside, it definitely feels uh, risky. Given the fact that your background isn't in technology and crypto, what did you and your team find most interesting in going through this process and exploring this story? I think just all of the, the wild west of it all and all of the twists and turns are the most interesting thing. I mean, you really... I'm sure someone will do it, but if you write this story, it sounds unfathomable. I mean, it sounds unfathomable that this guy in his 20s could have that much money pouring in, that people would trust him that much, that he would die in the way that he died, that, you know, I mean, all of the things along the way that he wouldn't have bank accounts, that he could operate that way. So I think at every turn we were like, what? And we put things, we only put things in the film that were provable. I mean, obviously, legally, we had to up, down and sideways and, and make sure everything was traceable. But there were other things along the way where you're like, that isn't possible. But maybe, maybe it was. There were name changes and, you know, people who came in and out and people allegedly involved that, you know, we couldn't prove and, and on and on. So just the the scope of it. What do you think the takeaway should be for people who are watching your film? Is, is it geared towards investors, a cautionary tale? Is it geared towards individuals, corporate fiduciary, exchange owners? Who? What's the takeaway for the various people who are seeing it? I think the takeaway from the film is different depending on where you sit and what your knowledge around cryptocurrency is, your curiosity around just the mystery itself. I mean, it is made for people who have a basic knowledge of cryptocurrency or no knowledge at all. It's certainly someone who knows a lot about cryptocurrency uh, would be able to um, run circles around the information that we've given in the film. So it's a balance between the story of Gerald Cotton and cryptocurrency and sort of this elaborate, mysterious scam. So at, at its core, it's entertainment. However, I think there is a cautionary tale just do some research about where you're going to put your money. I think we we are used to trusting big business. I've said this in other interviews. I have money sitting on PayPal and even having this knowledge, I don't know who runs PayPal. If that went under, that money would be gone. And so I trust the system. And I think that I'm not uncommon in that way, that we trust systems. And we assume if there's a company 
that has a website and has a name and is collecting other people's money, they must be okay. And we, so we don't do a lot of research. So if you're going to put a lot of money in, <laughs> do some research. Uh, I think if you're going to invest in cryptocurrency, you have to know that it can be precarious. Don't risk more than you're prepared to lose. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and I think one of the takeaways for me personally, because I had to invest something to understand the process and how it worked, I realized that I am, I'm like everybody else. Even though I was doing research, I still got kind of obsessed with the idea of it. And I watched the ups and downs and I watched it more than I thought I should. And I wanted to invest more than I had. Even with that knowledge, it was like, oh, right, this is how the system works and why we get sucked in. There's a very, I was compelled by my own humanness of being basically like everybody else. I, I think one thing that you said, which is that everybody trusts the system is spot on, right? I mean, we, we all trust the system, whatever system it is. And whether it's me as an attorney planner or whoever it is, we're all trusting that everything is working and everything is going to be working well. So I think that's I think that's good advice. And um, that somebody else probably vetted it, right? Like, well, oh, and we trust our friends. So, oh, my friend Bob said I should invest and this is the company to go into. So I trust Bob. So I trust that Bob probably did his, his research. So we trust other people, particularly when we want to believe something. So let's come back to Quadriga in a few minutes, but let's first talk to Jen and Sharon about their book, A Digital Asset Entanglement, Unraveling the Intersection of Estate Laws and Technologies. So Jen and Sharon, the fundamental structure of your book focuses on planning with different types of client personas. Can you describe for us what you mean by client personas? Client personas is just a simple concept about encapsulating a client's online digital use. You know, think of it, we talk about use cases. It's a use case of a, how a client uses technology day to day, right? So estate planners need a framework to start discovery and estate planning. Like, how do you start asking a question about their digital lives? It's just endless. You could have pages of inventories. You know, you could r randomly ask questions. But in order for us to develop practices and policies, we need an analysis framework, and that's what we are presenting here, uh, a framework that can be used globally and within a firm or a practitioner, because we understand the process needs to be repeatable. And in fact, we see the process of client onboarding and the intake process and discovery becoming automated as the digitization of the estate industry unfolds. So in simplicity, the, the client personas will allow an advisor to understand the general implications of a client's use. Are they using it a little bit? Are they using it more? Are they helping other people? Or are they the tech nomad like Gerald Cotton? And from that starting point, there's others, obviously, specific things to address that gives the framework uh, a fuller view but you can use that as a basis to evolve practices and tools and policies. And we also developed it so that tech entrepreneurs could use it as a use case as they build solutions to solve the estate industry issues. We really recognize that digital asset planning is not a one size fits all approach. And putting everybody into certain silos, you know, and, and planning mechanisms, it's not really appropriate. And so we develop six different client user personas in the book to help kind of uh, elect questions for advisors to draw upon to begin to really shape what planning a client needs. And a lot of times, you know, I, I get people telling me, oh, well, I don't really have any digital assets. And as we start to really dive into, well, you know, do you use email? How do you pay your bills? It becomes very evident to them quickly that they have a lot more digital assets than they previously realized. And so that really begins to set the tone for getting them open to do some planning, because a lot of people are hesitant, you know, when you talk about digital assets, they think I don't have cryptocurrencies, I don't have NFTs, you know, why do I need to do this? So can we flesh that out a little bit more? Can you give us an example of one or two of those personas and and talk through how a planning attorney might use this to their benefit to better understand their process and working with their clients and go down that rabbit hole a little bit? From the six personas, you know, the first one is a basic 
persona. And a lot of the personas can overlap. And as technology evolves, you know, these methodologies are going to also naturally expand and grow. And so this isn't an exhaustive list. But for a basic user, you know, this is somebody who has at least one email account. They may have a social media profile. They may be storing documents, you know, in a cloud or documents in some other type of file share program. And they likely are conducting some household bill pay or account management online. But these people are not running online businesses. They're not participating in the gig economy, like selling crafts on Etsy, which is a whole other different type of persona that we analyze. But by really kind of pulling out and teasing out the online activities and behaviors of the client, we can begin to find areas to address and uncover things to put into place. So for instance, you know, one of the basic steps would be to create a digital asset inventory of all of, you know, the digital accounts and devices and uh, things that may be stored online. And it grows, you know, from there. Sharon, Jen spoke about the basic persona. Can you talk a little bit about um, more of the complicated personas? Uh, Certainly. So Jen and I have developed six client user personas and Jen covered the basic user. And as Jen said, they build on each other. So the second one is the super user and tech support community, which is one of my favorite personas because a lot of people are helping their parents or their aunts and uncles or even their children with basic user support, like opening a web browser and filling out a form. And IT people that are providing help to us, we don't have IT departments at our house. We're probably relying on a friend who can help us fix our computer. And those individuals tend to work in the community, too. We know a lot of people uh, provide time for nonprofit organizations and charitable organizations, and then potentially they're providing IT support for those organizations. So the number of digital assets they're touching that might impact other people starts to grow. The third persona is a gaming and entertainment users. The fourth persona is a digital platform economy users, the one that Jen referred to before. The fifth are small business owners and content creators. And then the last persona is tech innovators and nomads. And the reason the personas are very helpful for estate planners is you have to assume at the start of a discovery session with a brand new client that you don't know that they are minimally a basic user. And as you talk through them, you are either confirming they're a basic user, so there's legal and technical implications to that. So as Jen pointed out, if they have email, you know, and they're using Gmail, you know, what pre-planning tools should they potentially use? But then as you open the door, you may find out that they have an online hobby. So that then adds another persona and other implications. And as Jen points out, that's not to say there aren't specific planning requirements around a specific digital asset, because there is. Within a persona, once you've done the basic things, you'll start to discover that even for a basic user, they may have a very specific digital asset that needs additional planning, like their photos or their loyalty points. And so additional work is needed to be done around those, around terms of service, et cetera. It's a framework. It's very solid. Uh, Jen and I researched a lot of software development methodologies and legal analysis frameworks to come up with something that we can use as a starting point or we're proposing to use as a starting point. Uh, to to begin to address digital assets and planning. So let's pretend to go back in time and let's say Jerry Cotton, the founder of Quadriga, walks into your office, either of your offices, and says, help me plan. And let's assume there's no foul play. Let's assume there's no fraud and there is a straightforward planning opportunity. I assume he is the top tier. He is the level six of what you're referring to in your personas, right? The tech innovator. The tech yes. innovator, exactly. He, he actually overlaps with a couple areas. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. What is what do you say to him? What like where do you even start with something that complex and that complicated of a plan when it comes to digital assets? In other words, what major changes? There's a lot of things he probably didn't do right if he intended for assets to be successfully transferred to beneficiaries. Where do we even start with a case like that? It's that extreme. I think from an estate planner's point of view, there are two primary aspects to his estate and business that have to be addressed. You know, the first one focuses on the business interests themselves and business succession planning, and that could include uh, everything that a company would do to have an IT plan and and, uh, business succession planning around that. And we didn't see much evidence, if any, that that was done. The second focuses on the individual and their personal digital assets. And we know, and Jen will talk about this, I'm sure, uh, 
that he he had a will and he had a digital asset clause in the will. Uh, but it was quite a complicated situation because, you know, you may give someone the right to access your digital asset. But we know in uh, digital asset planning, we also have to leave instructions or do pre-planning for those elements. And as we see in this case, his situation was complicated because there was no clear separation from his business interests in Quadriga and his personal life. We we know from reading the um, the court uh, documents that the bankruptcy trustee asked the widow to seek a court order to access his Gmail, for an example. And that would lead to questions like, was this a personal account or business account or was it used with both? And, you know, why was it uh, why did they seek it in this way? I think the bifurcation of personal and and business assets and activities would be, you know, one of the first steps in, in planning for him. And he did have a will, as Sharon mentioned, and his will was actually signed uh, roughly two weeks before his death, which is, is very fascinating. And his digital asset clause, you know, did grant fiduciary access to his online accounts and documents and devices. He also had a separate clause you know, specifically bequeathing his frequent flyer miles and certain reward points to his wife. But his will did not, um, although it had some boilerplate business provisions, did not really address Quadriga at all. And I, I've often thought, you know, I wonder what conversations were like when he was going through that planning process to get a will in place, if the, you know, if the attorney did did talk to him about that or, you know, what his level of interest in, in really getting a succession plan in place, because that's usually a natural point in time um, for small, it was not really a small business, but for business owners to begin to think about those things when they're doing personal planning. But I think with him, it, it's really interesting that although he had this digital asset clause, which we'll talk about, you know, what we discovered with, you know, his estate having to uh, petition Google for access to his Gmail account that he allegedly used for business activities, was that, you know, that wasn't enough. You know, an estate planning clause giving fiduciary access while helpful and can certainly expand the amount of information, you know, an estate can ultimately receive from what we've seen seen, there really wasn't anything meaningful discovered, you know, after all that time and energy and efforts for those court proceedings were done. So he needed also a, a much more robust technological management plan. And we've also discovered from his early days that he had uh, collected a lot of domain names. And so, you know, to my knowledge, there's never been any inventory of his personal assets. There were inventories done in the bankruptcy proceedings for Quadriga, but not, you know, really for his personal assets or potential domains. I also want to point out that he was uh, early to the crypto party, and there really wasn't ever any discussion about bifurcation of what cryptocurrency would have been on Quadriga and, and if he had anything, you know, individually or, or personally. It sounds like a lot of the things that we tell our clients to do, regardless of what persona they are, whether they're the first persona, the second persona, the third persona, all the way up to the sixth persona, it sounds like a lot of those things he didn't do, right? He didn't do an inventory. He didn't figure out his online tools, right? He, he, he didn't have pieces in place to account for what happens when he dies, right? Shona, there was no dead man switch in place like there is in a Google account or in his exchange. Other than just saying we need to do all of these things, how can we change what we what our clients do and how can we advise our clients the importance and the need to do all of these things? Do we just look at the the cotton estate and say, well, here's how everything can go wrong? What do we do? Well, I think one of the first steps is, and, and this is one of you know the the point of the book, is to really raise the alarm bells and make sure people understand that this is a big issue. Because if they don't think this is a big issue, and you know, as I mentioned, I often you know get met with an answer, I don't have any digital assets. Only five minutes later, for the client to realize how many digital assets that they do have, if people aren't understanding this just at a, a general level 
they're not going to change their behaviors. They're not going to take the extra steps, you know, to plan for these assets if they don't think that there is a real value to do that. And of course, in, in Jerry's estate, it could be a monetary value with, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency. But for, for a basic user, you know, who might not have those types of assets, there are sentimental value. There could be key information. And of course, there's just personal identifiable information that could be in, you know, a slew of online accounts that might not generate, you know, sentimental or monetary value. But the identity theft and cybersecurity issues, you know, especially with the pandemic has extremely increased. And so knowing that these accounts exist just for privacy and, and protection of, you know, someone's identity is, is in and of itself a reason, you know, to begin to plan for these assets. And then on top of that, layering on, you know, monetary implications that could cause a loss, you know, to an estate and beneficiaries, and of course, sentimental materials that could be lost. So I think it's making sure people really understand and have a conceptual checkpoint that, that this is a big issue is, is the first step. And I think we've seen a lot of resistance, you know, generally. I mean, Justin Ross, you talk with clients about this, kind of turning the tables back on you. Sorry, I can't help it. You know, what do you see with clients? I mean, do most people also tell you they don't really have digital assets, you know, when broached with that question? Absolutely. I think we have all been talking about this for a number of years now. And, and I think at the very beginning, if if we would ask a crowd of people how many people own uh, digital assets, you would have maybe a dozen people raise their hand. And at least the hands have increased in size over time, right? So at least people are recognizing that they have digital assets. They recognize their phone contains digital information. I think there's still the feeling that if you don't own cryptocurrency, you really don't own digital assets, right? There's there's sentimental value to digital assets. There's financial value to digital assets. It's more than just Bitcoin, right? It's more than just the private keys. And I think we need to get past that in the industry so that people can start recognizing all the assets they have, right? Whether it's the money that you own on your PayPal or that you own in Venmo or Apple Pay or you pick whatever service it is, airline miles, all of those things, they all have value that we need to be planning around. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that although the book provides obviously an in-depth and solid framework to addressing the digital asset planning for the estate industry, uh, the book also, as Jen points out, uh, takes a story that everyone has heard about and and brings it home in terms of the digital assets we have in our life. E even yesterday on LinkedIn, I, I was messaging with an old colleague who knows you know knows my whole time at IBM and 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 was was and we were talking about my new book. He he messaged to me to say, oh you know I'm going to get your book, great, but I don't think I have any digital assets. And the, you know I I messaged back to say, well the fact you're on LinkedIn messaging with me says you have at least one. And did you know that you can memorialize or um, delete your account after death, but you have to tell your executor? And he's like, oh that's really interesting. And so I think. I think there's a huge massive general awareness that's not there that needs to be there because there's a financial implication to uh, digital assets even if it's your email or your paypal account and further i think the important uh stepping stone is to where the industry is going to go next the industry is digitizing so estate firms and estate lawyers and practitioners are using technology at home, their clients are using it at home, and our clients in the future are going to demand the same ease of use on dealing with the estate industry that they do with the retail sector or financial sector. And we're going to have solutions uh, we don't really understand yet as, as a consumer base because we're not really familiar with the role of the executor. We all know how to use a wallet and do online banking, but we don't realize the executor has a big job and that job will start to get digitized. Uh, so, so that's the next stage after we make everyone aware about digital assets and we start planning an organization to start adopting technology for the value add that it provides our client but and the cost efficiencies, but more importantly, to capture the breadth of our clients' portfolios that are now expanding. So I wanna go back to where we started the conversation with Shona, which is on the subject of dead man switch. And we, often dream about the future of smart contracts, of smart wills that execute automatically upon a certain event. I'm beginning to 
doubt maybe that we're not ready for such a world, that there's a lot that can go wrong. And would any of our guests care to comment on that general idea that we're, we're building in structures that are going to be counterintuitive to what we're intending our, our, the final outcome to be? I think you bring up a great point, Ross. And, you know, with regard to the dead man switch, there were reports, you know, at least early on, that Jerry had told people that he had a dead man switch. Um, and maybe he did. And it was never triggered if he did, in fact, have one. So that could lend itself to being an example of why, you know, dead man switch planning, you know, might not always work. Google's inactive account manager, you know, as Sharon mentioned, is in some ways a a dead man switch, you know, for uh, triggering the release of information or the deletion of an account uh, at the end of an inactivity period that a user sets. And we're seeing more service providers, you know, with these types of tools, like Apple just came out with its legacy contact. Facebook, you know, also has an online tool. And as we see these service providers growing in these options, making sure that there's cohesiveness with these various platforms that clients might be utilizing and, and this pre-setting functions on the platforms is going to grow much more complicated. And so, no, I, I don't think we're ready because I don't think there's a general awareness of, of the need for all of this and then layering on all the complexities that could come if these different features are being utilized and not inadvertently disrupting, you know, what should be a comprehensive estate plan. Hearing you all talk and thinking of this case specifically, something that we haven't mentioned that I think is unique to this and also sort of looking at the future is that Jerry was 30 years old. And I think historically, estate planning is something that people do mm -hmm. middle age and beyond. And what this digital technology, these digital technologies and all of these young entrepreneurs and people in a space that those of us older may not understand is we don't even know what their digital assets are and they're not used to thinking about planning. And I think that we're not used to about th having them think about planning and they don't think they're gonna die. So you have this collision, this sort of cyclone of things that are counterintuitive that we're trying to back, like sort of backhoe out of. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I, I think it, it, it is something that people just don't have on their radar screen, right? It's not going to happen to me. So, so why do I need to plan? Shona, thank you so much for coming. If our listeners want to watch your documentary, how can they access it? Uh, if they are in Canada, it's on CBC Gem, which is the CBC app, uh, free for everybody for the next three years uh, in the States and Discovery Plus. And in fact, Discovery Plus has a license for most of the world. And then there's a couple countries where you'd have to look it up, but it is available everywhere. And again, the name of Shona's documentary is Dead Man Switch, A Crypto Mystery. And our thanks to Sharon Hotog and Jen Sagel for coming on the show and for talking about your new book, Digital Asset Entanglement, Unraveling the Intersection of Estate Laws and Technology. And where can our listeners find your book? The book is available now on LexisNexis, so it can be found on a, a Google search on the LexisNexis page or just a Google search generally. And we will also include a link in the podcast posting. But we also have something special for our listeners. Uh, if you type in Gen 15, when you buy the book, you will get 15% off. Fantastic. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. We really learned a lot and we enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, we'll catch you on the next episode of the Digital Planning Podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast the podcast designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is not intended nor should be relied upon as legal advice, nor is it creating any attorney-client relationship with a listener and the hosts or guests. The information provided is only for educational and informational purposes, and the information provided will likely change.